So first, we'll talk about what is palliative care. So palliative care is an approach to care that focuses on improving quality of life and reducing suffering for people affected by serious illness. It involves intensive management of complex symptoms, psychosocial and spiritual support, and it affirms and supports life while also addressing death as a normal and expected process. And I always think it's interesting that in medical training, uh, there's a very big focus on learning about the birth process, and there's often OBGYN rotations, but there's often not a lot of education about um, treating people with chronic illness, focusing on their symptoms, and then especially the end of life process. So this is a quote by Benzie Kluger, who is a neuropalliative clinician at University of Rochester. He actually started the first neuropalliative clinic in the United States, and it was focused on people living with Parkinson's disease and related disorders. And he says, medicine turns people into patients. Palliative care turns patients back into people. So palliative care, it's important to note, can be appropriate at any point of an illness, including at the time of diagnosis. It can be used alone or to augment curative treatments. And many of my patients, or most of my patients, are actually still getting cancer-directed treatments. Often benefits from a team approach, so we really rely on our um, pharmacists, our social workers, our chaplains uh, to give the best uh, quality care. It can be delivered in the inpatient, outpatient, community, home, and hospice setting. So for instance, I uh, do both inpatient and outpatient palliative care provides care for both patients and their loved ones, helps with effective communication between families and between teams, and assists with difficult decisions. And this is just a picture showing that palliative care really spans from, can span from the beginning of diagnosis all the way to the end of death. So in the upper uh, right corner is a picture of my palliative medicine fellowship class. And I just wanted to point out, there's actually two neurologists in there, myself included, two emergency medicine doctors, uh, one palliative care social worker. So I think a lot of people think that uh, palliative medicine is often more internal medicine or family medicine, but I think there's a big push uh, for people in other specialties recognizing the importance of palliative care and definitely a growth um, in the fields. So what do we do? So there's a big focus on symptom management. So that involves uh, pain medications, including learning about opioid conversions, but also when to refer to other services like interventional pain or rehab or radiation oncology, and then asking about other symptoms that may be overlooked, things like fatigue, nausea, constipation. There's also a big emphasis on language and communication. And my program director, when I started, explained, you know, every surgeon has their procedure that is kind of their specialty, the thing that they focus on and practice uh, again and again. And for palliative care clinicians, communication is that procedure for us. It's something that can constantly be refined and improved, uh, and uh, we definitely focus on skills for that. Recognizing nonverbal cues and responding to emotion. There's also a big picture view uh, and a big focus on patient-centered patient considerations. And sometimes I think clinicians can get very focused on treating without necessarily thinking about the potential side effects and considering the individuals and families' values in light of this. Less talking, more listening. So there is even evidence that patients' approval ratings go up when they speak for larger percentages of the visit. But as neurology clinicians, I think we're all really good at listening as the history is so important. So we're all in good company here. Asking the questions no one else is asking. Things like, what are you hoping for? What are you worried about? Have you thought about a time when the treatment doesn't go as we're hoping for? Aligning with patient and family goals above all else. And uh, this is something, you know, I think before going into doing a year of palliative care training, um, I, we would get these consults and the team is really focused on getting the DNR that the patient and family decide on hospice. And for palliative care, it's never the goal. The goal is really to make sure the patients and the families have a good understanding of the disease state and the decisions before them and that their values and priorities are heard in response to this information. 
And there's definitely cases where full code sometimes and continuing with life-sustaining measures aligns with these goals. And I think this kind of goes into the next point, noting and addressing one's own bias and removing it from the equation. Um, so I think it's important to remember there's such thing as the disability paradox and that values and priorities often change in the course of serious illness. So studies have shown, for instance, people living with ALS and those with locked-in syndrome, their quality of life is better than others expect. So you can't necessarily know how you're going to feel about living with serious illness unless you have it. So it can be really difficult to put yourself in someone else's shoes. I always bring this paper up for any palliative care introduction talk. Um, it was a seminal study by Tamel et al. It was in 2010. It was a non-blinded randomized controlled trial of early palliative care integrated with standard on care alone uh, as compared to just standard oncologic care. It was done at MGH in Boston. Uh, and for the early palliative care part, basically you are eligible if, um, if you were enrolled within eight weeks after diagnosis. And so you're randomly assigned to one of these two groups. And what the study found was that the patients assigned to early palliative care compared to standard care alone had better quality of life, fewer patients had depressive symptoms, fewer patients received aggressive end of life care, and most interestingly, uh, the patients with the early palliative care also had a longer median survival, 11.6 months versus 8.9 months. So now uh, specifically focusing on neuropalliative care. So you all more than anyone understand that neuro neurologic illness may be incurable, short in lifespan, result in disability and dependence, reduce quality of life, be painful, cause emotional and spiritual distress, burden the caregiver, come with many treatment decisions, and those treatment decisions are increasing uh, the more advancements we have, entail complex end-of-life issues, and cause suffering. And some people in neuropalliative would um, argue that often that suffering is unique compared to even other diseases. So existential and psychological suffering in neurologic disease. So people living with neurologic disease often experience the disease as intrinsic to their person. The disease may be affecting their physical strength, their personality, cognitive ability, or the ability to communicate. And these are really the things that make us who we are as people. And this, along with these physical and cognitive difficulties, may contribute to people feeling like they're useless or a burden. And these together can lead to loss of self and personhood. And some would argue that this may actually differ from patients with cancer, uh, non-neurologic cancer, who may see the cancer as something outside of themselves, something that can be fought or removed. The caregiver burden uh, in these diseases is increased given the high level of physical and cognitive disabilities, the presence of psychiatric and behavioral issues, the frequently long duration of caregiving needs, and unfortunately, the fact that even some nursing homes and sometimes hospices are often ill-equipped or unwilling to care for these patients. And I think of patients with Lewy body dementia, where there's a lot of agitation or Huntington's disease, um, where they don't really know necessarily how to best take care of them. And of course, there's prognostic uncertainty in all diseases, but you all as neurologists know that prognostic uncertainty is even greater in neurology. Um, and I'm sure you all have had cases even recently where you didn't know necessarily what the future was gonna look like for this person. And so this prognostic uncertainty can be a big barrier for people having these serious illness conversations because no one wants to be wrong and it can be uncomfortable to say that you just don't know or you're worried about taking away hope. So sometimes there can be frameworks that can be helpful for these sorts of situations using things like a best, worst, or most likely case scenario, where you really come up with a team thinking about, you know, what would these scenarios be and uh, communicating these to the family or the patient. Also time limited trials. So this is an agreement to use certain medical therapies like IC level care, EBD, or steroids for a defined period of time and then regrouping 
um, after to see if there's been improvement and if not discussing next steps. And finally, I just again want to mention this disability paradox that the quality of life of people living with disability or cognitive impairment is typically underestimated by the people living without them. Uh, and this, for anyone with a serious illness, I think this can be um, something that's really poignant. For example, when I was a third year medical student, my father had a stroke, a large left MCA stroke. And I think if he had uh, tried to figure out what his quality of life would be before the stroke, uh, he would not say that this was good quality of life. Um, but he really has adapted to a new state and we've had so many happy memories uh, and, you know, it, it really is hard to know how you're going to feel about something until you're in that situation. So the American Academy of Neurology, um, the last, uh, the first position statement was in 1996 and it said many patients with neurologic disease die after long illnesses during which a neurologist acts as the principal or consulting physician. Therefore, it's imperative that neurologists understand and learn to apply the principles of palliative medicine. And since 1996, there have been few, if any, hours of palliative care and neurology education curriculum at most residencies. Palliative care has expanded from cancer to heart failure, lung disease, and end-stage renal disease. There are rising rates of burnout in neurology, there are an increasing number of neurologists like myself who are double boarded in neurology and hospice and palliative medicine. And there's been more interest in palliative care for many neurologic conditions, including ALS, dementia, stroke, and Parkinson's disease. And so 1996 was a long time ago, but then luckily very recently, uh, the AN came out with another position statement with clinical guidance in neuropalliative care. And I'll just read the end. Uh, as the field of neuropalliative care evolves, we must make a concerted effort to not only recognize the obligation that all neurologic clinicians have to attend to palliative needs, but also learn to identify when challenging cases will benefit from the assistance of specialists in the field. So this brings me to my next slide and showing that neuropalliative care really is a system. So, you know, you, this is like a three-legged stool approach. The first leg, the most important, is the neurology clinicians, or is it, if it's the primary care physicians who are managing the neurologic illness. Uh, and then, you know, if there are more complex needs, you have specialist palliative care. And then there are also community organizations, spiritual organizations, um, social work all the other groups that are supporting these patients. But primary palliative care is incredibly important. Uh, so these are some suggested, suggested core palliative care skills for neuro neurologists. Identify common palliative care needs associated with specific neurologic disorders. Detect and manage whole body pain. Provide basic psychosocial and spiritual support. Acquire communication skills, including empathetic listening. Effectively estimate and communicate prognosis and uncertainty. Master shared decision-making for common preference sensitive decisions. Master shared decision-making and support for patients and families around tragic choices. Be aware of palliative care options of last resort and recognize and manage caregiver distress and needs. And again, it's so important that the neurology cl clinicians are providing this primary palliative care because the patients want to have a lot of these conversations and these treatments from the people they trust the most, um, their neurology clinicians. Um, of course, uh, specialty palliative care should be considered in cases of refractory symptoms, complex grief or existential distress, interpersonal conflict between patients, caregivers, or healthcare providers, or when there are requests for non-beneficial treatments. But really, there aren't even enough um, palliative care specialists to treat all these people living with serious neurologic illness. And also, as we all know, there's a lot of neurophobia out there, and a lot of palliative care doctors aren't neurology trained. Um, so again, it's, it's really important, the skill of primary palliative care. Next, I'll talk about some possible unmet palliative care needs under the current models of care and give you some supporting literature. So first, poor communication and inadequate psychosocial support at the time of diagnosis. 
And so this uh, is from a Jerry Powell uh, podcast. Uh, it's actually Dr. Benzie Kluver, who I talked about before, who'd started the first neuropalliative clinic for people living with Parkinson's disease and uh, related disorders. Um, and I thought this was really poignant uh, in what he said, so I'll just read part of what he said on his podcast. There's a blind spot that a lot of neurologists have, and I would say myself included for quite a while. They felt that giving someone a diagnosis of Parkinson's was good news because it's better than Alzheimer's, it's better than ALS, it's better than a brain tumor. We have treatments for it. We have carbidopa and levodopa and deep brain stimulation. But for the person getting that news, of course, it's not good news. And when we did these qualitative interviews, I would hear this story again and again, that people saw a neurologist based on the way they walked or their tremor, or they were diagnosed within five minutes, they were given cinnamon, they were told to come back in a few months, and they were in tears by the time they got to their car. And it took them several years for them to catch up emotionally to that diagnosis. And he goes on to say, uh, the other thing I'll mention up front is in the United States, it's the 14th leading cause of death. And a lot of time, I think neurologists may be even more guilty of this than others, that we don't think of Parkinson's disease as a terminal illness. Pictures of Parkinson's is Tremor, it's Michael J. Fox, or Davis Finney, a famous cycler. We talk about living well with Parkinson's, but it's a terminal illness. People's life expectancy is shortened, and people die of complications of this disorder. As many of 80% of people with Parkinson's will develop dementia if they live 15 to 20 years with the disorder. Many will have significant pain related to their Parkinson's. Depression is incredibly common. Demoralization is. Caregiver burden is high. And so as I talk about it, I mean, hopefully people listening in are thinking, why haven't people been doing palliative care for Parkinson's all along? Next, under recognition and under treatment of symptoms. So this uh, is from a study in ALS. And so over here, um, this was surveying people living with ALS and looking at symptom prevalence. Um, so you can see, uh, and then the severity. So light gray is mild, dark gray is moderate, and then little axis is severe. And you can see a lot of symptoms, including non-motor symptoms like fatigue, sleep difficulty, pain, anxiety, depression, um, there's a, you know, a lot prevalent there. And then in terms of treatment, the white is no, and you can see a lot of these same symptoms, the patients felt like we're not being treated. Again, a lot of non-motor ones as well uh, that you might not be asking about as much like fatigue, sleep difficulty, pain, anxiety, depression. This was a survey of uh, people living with Parkinson's disease. The symptoms are over here. And then um, you have these columns with the percentage of prevalence. Um, the top is the overall symptom prevalence and then the dark blue is uncontrolled symptoms. And again, you're seeing a lot of non-motor ones um, like fatigue, um, constipation, insomnia, anxiety. And what this study found was actually the non-motor symptoms were the most highly associated with poor quality of life. Next, uh, low rates of advanced care planning discussions and completion of advanced directives. So uh, the goal of this retrospective study was to quantify the extent of documentation of preferences for life-sustaining interventions. So you can see these over here um, in a population-based cohort of ischemic stroke patients who all died within 30 days post-stroke. Uh, and so what they found was, you know, these are pretty important conversations. Um, any of these five, inter even with any of these five interventions, like DNR, DNI, uh, enteral tube feeding, there was only 39% documentation of physician uh, communication. So again, this was um, all of these patients died within 30 days of their stroke. Next, uh, lack of standardized approach to goals of care discussions. And so this study is more to highlight just, um, you know, why are inpatient palliative care consults being called for neurology cases? Um, and this is neurology versus cancer. And so as you can see, the neuro cases were much more often in a critical care location and they were much sicker. So it, based on the palliative performance scale, a lower scale means more functionally disabled and sicker. Um, and you can see that these, this number is much lower compared to the cancer patients. 
um, and symptom management was much less common. So there's a lot of goals of care happening in these um, consults, and there really isn't one standardized um, way. And I think there's you know, not a lot of communication training for the people having these conversations. And finally, low rates of hospice use and high rates of hospital deaths. So hospital deaths among patients with chronic neurologic disorders are high. Uh, study shows that it's 43% for Parkinson's disease, 56% for MS. And hospice deaths are extremely uncommon in these diseases, 0.6% and 2.5% respectively. Interestingly, there's no disease-specific criteria for determining hospice readiness for either of these diseases which may contribute to underutilization. The main point is that criteria for hospice eligibility was really developed for cancer patients. So it's less appropriate or absent for chronic neurodegenerative diseases. And also I brought this up before, but there are concerns that hospice systems and providers may be less comfortable accepting patients with neurologic diagnoses. And this is a table looking at the hospice guidelines for neurologic disorders. So you can see dementia has some specific criteria, stroke or coma does. And then you have a bunch of the neuro diseases kind of grouped together, ALS, Parkinson's, myasthenia, MS. Um, and it's also important to know that these are just guidelines. Um, it really comes down to the hospice physician determining based on what's going on, their comorbidities, whether or not they think they have less than six months to live. So next, um, so one of the big reasons that I'm so passionate about neuropalliative care is that um, we're gonna talk about some cases later that kind of guided me towards this path, uh, but we had no palliative care education in my uh, neurology training. Um, so I thought I'd just talk a little bit about some studies looking at the state of training. So uh, the ACGME before 2019, the only reference they made to discussion of patients' care values was indirect, that neurology residents must demonstrate knowledge of palliative care, including adequate pain relief, as well as psychosocial support and counseling for patients and families. And then in 2019, they added that uh, residents must learn to communicate with patients and families to partner with them to assess their care goals, including when appropriate end of life goals. And then there was this background and intent. Um, and unfortunately, they kind of really only focused on the end of life. Um, so when there are no more medications or interventions that can achieve a patient's goals or provide meaningful improvements in quality or length of life, a discussion about the patient's goals, values, and choices surrounding the end of life is one of the most important conversations that it can occur. Um, so there was a, an opinion piece about this and uh, there was concern that, um, you know, there is always more, there's always more medications we can give or other interventions we can give, even when the focus is on comfort. Um, and by positioning the elicitation of care preferences as a last resort, there's opportunities um, that are missed to improve the quality of life throughout the course of illness. Um, so really, the ACGME should make clear that care values and preferences can and should be discussed with patients, regardless of the stage of the disease. Uh, and uh, all neurology clinicians should be trained to routinely incorporate this aspect of primary palliative care into their practice. So in a 2017 survey of neurology residency program directors, almost half of them were not satisfied with their palliative care education available in their programs and one out of five reported having no palp care education at all. Um, the barriers were teaching time, faculty availability, and educational resources. And a study in 2009 found only 52% of neurology programs offered a didactic experience in end of life or palliative care, and less than 8% provided a clinical rotation. And this was a study that came out of NYU where um, the department surveyed the residents and the faculty looking at a bunch of communication and professionalism tasks. And the residents said whether they felt like they um, had been observed doing these tasks and the faculty uh, said whether or not they had observed these tasks. Uh, and it was really important things, things like breaking bad news, um, leading goals of care discussions, discussing prognoses. And you can see the numbers are low. 
Uh, and interestingly, there is a bit of a mismatch where the faculty feel like they're observing more than the residents feel like they're being observed doing these things. And then on this side, uh, it was the same thing, but feedback. Um, so the residents were saying whether they got feedback and the faculty were saying whether they gave feedback on these same tasks. And again, you can see these numbers are even lower and there's even more of a mismatch. So this was an article that came up with some recommended steps to improve education and primary palliative care for neurology clinicians. Simulated patient training to teach how to respond to emotion, give bad news and discuss goals of care. When discussing progressive or incurable neurologic diseases, include a review of palliative aspects and case discussions, including symptom management and caregiver issues. Give resources to debrief end of life cases that are emotionally difficult. Identify palliative care champions within the neurology faculty to collaborate with the palliative care faculty to develop education. Offer rotations in inpatient palliative care. Provide faculty development in palliative care, particularly emphasizing a structured approach to family meetings and how to teach family meeting skills. Teach family meetings as procedures with dedicated time, debriefing, and feedback and then something about um, milestone evaluations and clinical assessment. So next, I thought I would talk a bit about some cases throughout my training and as an attending that have been really meaningful for me and I feel like have kind of um, helped me choose this path and, and figure out what I wanted to do. So as a PGY3, I was working at Elmhurst Hospital, which is a public hospital in Queens, uh, and it was an overnight shift. So when we're overnight, we're the only neurologist in the house, and a patient came in, a stroke code was called, uh, and when we got to the CT scanner, we found that unfortunately uh, he had a large intracerebral hemorrhage. Neurosurgery was called, and unfortunately there was nothing that they could do surgically. Um, and so the emergency room, at this point, the patient's children had arrived and they asked that I um, speak to the family and give them the unfortunate news and kind of talk about next steps because they were um, planning to intubate. And uh, I'm sure you all have been in similar situations where kind of the weight of what you're about to go talk about just kind of hits you very suddenly. Um, that this is the worst day this family is going to have and that they'll probably remember this moment for a really long time. And I just felt completely unprepared. We had had no communication training, um, no debriefs about kind of like how to manage these sorts of conversations despite us having them not infrequently. Um, and so I had done like a palliative care rotation as a medical student and Kind of remembered this spikes mnemonic that's just kind of how to set up uh, a difficult conversation and kind of includes getting them in a private room and sitting everyone down, making sure we had an interpreter because uh, they were Spanish speaking, um, and kind of delivering the news uh, after you know finding out what they understand. Um, and you know once I shared the information, they're understandably incredibly upset uh, and. Then I asked them to kind of speak about their father a bit, and they explained that his wife had um, had a COPD exacerbation about a year prior and had been intubated and hospitalized for a really long time with a bunch of um, complications, and it eventually died after a really prolonged hospitalization, and it was just incredibly difficult for the husband, it was incredibly difficult for the family, and he had shared to them that he would never, never want something like that. Um, and so they decided to not intubate him and uh, to really focus on his comfort. We were able to call the palliative care team to give us some overnight recommendations, um, get the chaplain in the next day and really um, allow the family to be with him. Uh, they were kind of like around the bedside singing prayers um, when he did eventually die the next day. Uh, in my PGY four years, uh, a senior neurology resident, uh, we had this case where um, the outpatient, one of the outpatient neurologists had been, had seen this patient where it's kind of like a classic 
rapidly progressive dementia and um, difficulty walking. So the concern was for Kreutzel Jakob, but they'd started a workup hoping that it was something else. Um, so this Lyme test had come back, like maybe positive, and they were thinking, okay, maybe this is some sort of encephalitis, uh, maybe autoimmune. Um, so the patient was admitted for IV antibiotics, then got some uh, steroids as well. Um, but yeah, she was like a late 70s Korean woman. She had these three incredibly dedicated daughters. This was before COVID, before visitor restrictions. So they, someone was there 24-7. They were uh, incredible advocates for their mom, but there was a lot of frustra frustration and focus on little things. And I'm sure we've all had these cases where you come in in the morning and you don't want to go into this one patient's room because you know you're going to be met with something that went wrong. And this is how it was every day. There was a big focus on her um, difficulty sleeping, which I'm sure the, the steroids were not helping. Um, and we'd had psych involved and we had palliative care involved and psych was titrating catiapine. Um, and, you know, it was supposed to be at this specific time. And of course, like it's the meds are never given at a specific time. And the family just held on to that. They're like, well, because this wasn't given at 9 p.m. on the dot, this is why our mother was agitated. And it's just so easy to get caught up in this, the stress of the family members. And like, I felt like I was failing the patient. I felt like I was failing the family members. Like each night I was talking to the nurses, like, please give this medication at this exact time. Um, and the palliative care team was just so helpful in kind of reframing the picture, uh, the, the big picture that the patient was dying, that this was most likely kreutzfeldt Jakob. Um, and that became more apparent, especially when the studies came back. And, uh, you know, once we were able to kind of focus on that and that these really were the symptoms of the disease and they were going to continue to get worse, we were able to focus more on like what was important to the patient and what would be best for her going forward. They'd really been hoping to get her home and everyone just realized this was not going to be possible. Uh, they were not going to be able to take care of her. And so she did end up, um, they did end up deciding to send her to inpatient hospice where she passed. And the family, like, even after all of that, um, you know, they did call to thank the team. So I think we really were able to turn it around once we were able to focus on that big picture and to be able to support them. Um, just checking the time. Okay. So uh, I also did a one-year neuromuscular fellowship. Um, and for this case, so of course, Friday afternoon, always the most complex cases would come in that we had no idea what was going on. They would need these very long EMGs um, when you're, you're hoping to leave for the weekend. Um, but uh, so yeah, this was a man in early seventies, um, incredibly independent, had never married, um, his, had never had children. His only living family was this sister who was a medical social worker. Uh, and he was becoming uh, weaker. And he lived in this uh, independent living facility. And they were starting to basically say, you're not going to be able to stay here much longer, really, because he'd been having falls. Um, so based on our workup, our thought was this is either CIDP or progressive muscular atrophy. But the hope was that it was CIDP um, and that he could get better. And so we started IVIG treatments. Um, and I think this is just one of those cases we, we, we all got so close with this patient. He was just this lovely guy. He was always joking. He was this New York City photographer. So these are all photos that he took, um, that I purchased, uh, he was able to sign them for me. Um, and so with the IVIG treatments, he felt like he was getting better. And I, I think it was probably more just a placebo effect, but, um, we kind of, I think got lost in his hope um, and probably didn't focus as much on the fact that he really wasn't getting better and things were getting worse over time. So then the next year I am doing my hospice and palliative medicine fellowship and I actually get called for a goals of care conversation for this exact same patient that I'd gotten really close with during my neuromuscular year. Um, and unfortunately he'd had an aspiration event. So now he's having dysphagia and this is just really unfortunately looking like ALS. Um, and yeah, we, it was a really difficult conversation because I just, I felt 
kind of torn between my two roles, um, you know, as the astrologist, where we've, we've been treating and treating and hoping, um, and then as the palliative care person, where we really had to focus on explaining that we thought this was ALS um, and giving him all the information so he could make the next decisions. And when he heard this, he decided that, you know, he really did not want enteral tube feeding, that his life at this point, he was no longer living in his independent living facility where he'd had all of his friends. Um, he uh, was living in a nursing home. It was during COVID. He hadn't been able to socialize. Um, he hadn't been able to do his photography. Um, and he really decided to focus on his comfort. And he went to our palliative care unit and eventually um, to inpatient hospice where he ended up passing away. Um, but he really wanted an ice caramel macchiato. And so um, we definitely got him that as soon as we were able to with speech and swallow kind of helping us make sure he was swallowing as safely as possible with comfort feeds. And finally, um, as an attending, I've definitely had a good number of goals of care conversations with our neuro on team. Um, one that I thought was interesting was uh, a woman in her early 80s with glioblastoma. Uh, and she was end stage of the disease. And unfortunately she had aspirated before coming to the hospital with respiratory um, distress and had to be put on high flow and was so incredibly tenuous that like any movement uh, caused her to desat. So we were planning to have a goals of care meeting kind of to discuss next steps with the family and share that we felt she was dying. Um, and that day she'd randomly had uh, her hemoglobin had dropped below seven. No one was really sure why, but they really couldn't even do a workup because uh, they couldn't get her down to imaging because of the respiratory status. Um, so we also brought this up as part of the meeting. And um, at, at this point, she really, for, for the teens, she really wasn't interactive. Uh, but the family shared that the last few days she'd had moments uh, where she had been able to be interactive, smiling with her family, her grandchildren, Got to see her. Um, and so this really brought the family joy. And while they understood that time was short, they were just hoping for more mo moments like this. Uh, and so the decision was to do a time limited trial of transfusion. Um, and she did have more moments of being awake and alert and interactive, which um, really made everyone incredibly happy. And she, I think, ended up living longer than most people expected, uh, which she did pass in the hospital. So finally, I just want to give some neuropalliative care resources. Uh, so the International Neuropalliative Care Society is actually relatively new. It was formed a few years ago. Um, but the thing that I really love about their group is that they have a focus on involving patients and their caregivers in a lot of what they do. And I really think that uh, getting their input allows us to best take care of everyone because again, they're the ones who understand what they're feeling and, and know how we can give better quality care. So the International Neuropalliative Care Society also has like an education section with a lot of great talks. And then the American Academy of Neurology has a palliative care section. Uh, so it's a great group of people with a uh, interest in neuropalliative care and you can post things in the forum, ask questions or connect. The American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine has something similar, a neuropalliative special interest group. Again, it's a great forum, and there's also some panels, um, probably about three a year, where they bring uh, people interested in neuropalliative care and, and talk about a specific topic. There are some neuropalliative care talk textbooks. I'm always happy to let people borrow them. And this is one that I think anyone who is interested in advancing their communication skills um, can really benefit from tips app you can put on your phone. Uh, it has great advice for um, how to go through goals of care meeting, discussing prognosis, responding to emotion, uh, talking about dying. Um, so really, really good tips. And finally, in conclusion, so palliative care is about living with serious illness as well as possible for as long as possible. People living with neurologic illness have substantial palliative care needs. You are all already providing primary palliative care. You're communicating difficult news. You're doing non-motor symptom assessment and management. You're doing advanced care planning. 
and caregiver assessment. There's always room for improvement in all of these and education should be a priority. Consider a referral to specialized palliative care for more complex needs. And I really do believe that collaboration is key. And finally, I just wanna say this work we do is incredibly difficult, incredibly emotional. So sometimes, you know, it feels like we're not making anything better, but we're, you know, sometimes the main way you can help is just by sitting with suffering and also being able to let these cases go at the end of the day for your own well-being. And that's a constant learning process for everyone and everyone does it differently. I really encourage debriefs. I think that was one of the main things you know, we did no debriefs when I was a um, neurology resident. And I, I think I would have benefited so much from them. It's a, a big uh, thing in palliative care, just given how emotional everything is. So that is the end of my talk. So wondering if people have questions, any comments, any 